Good afternoon and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this policy briefing on using behavioral insights to tackle policy issues such as health with a focus on non-communicable diseases. My name is Fadi Maki. I head the Qatar Behavioral Insights Unit. Proud to say it's the first nudge unit in the MENA region, focusing on behavioral roots of some of the challenges we're facing here and in the region, such as sports and healthy lifestyles, such as environmental sustainability, workers' welfare, entrepreneurship, and using the power of sports and the momentum generated by preparation for the World Cup to create behavioral change and lasting legacy. For this session today, we have a great panel, three distinguished speakers who offer, as you will see, amazing complementarity of perspectives. So we have a public health perspective, we have a behavioral science perspective, and we have a technology perspective. Our first panelist and keynote speaker is Professor Linda Fried, who brings in that public health perspective. She is Dean of the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University, where she's also Delamar Professor of Public Health Practice and Senior Vice President of Columbia University Medical Center. Dean Fried has dedicated her career to the science of healthy aging and the prevention of frailty, disability, and cardiovascular diseases, and defining how to transition to a world where greater longevity would benefit everybody people of all ages, through her concept of third demographic dividend. She's a recipient of numerous honors and awards, most recently the 2016 French Insurm International Prize in Medical Research, and the 2018 Crane's Notable Men in Healthcare. Dean Fried, we're honored to have you, welcome. Our second panelist is a very good friend with whom we've been working, is Professor Ivo Vlaev. Professor Vlaev is a professor of behavioral science at Warwick Business School. He is co-author co of the very well-known Mind Space Report, a report by the BIT and other authors published in 2010, to serve as a checklist for governments to apply behavioral insights and nudges in a cost-effective way. It's been used by nudge units worldwide. Much of his research focuses on decision science and behavioral change. Ivo, welcome. Our third panelist is Dr. Luis Fernandez Luque, who brings that technology angle to health and how it could be used to tackle NCDs. Dr. Luis Fernandez is a scientist at the Qatar Computing Research Institute. He has 14 years of experience in mobile health technologies, social media, and health. Much of his research focuses on advanced computing approaches for tackling major health problems using mobile and online technology. Welcome, Luis. So, non-communicable diseases are responsible for 70% of all death worldwide. And much of, their behavior, much of their risk factors are common, such as healthy lifestyle, eating healthy, physical activity. We all have those guidelines on what we should do to lead a healthy lifestyle. These are well widely known. So eating healthy, being physically active, screening regularly, and so on. Yet we do not seem to adhere to these guidelines. Why? Because we do not behave based on rational judgments and reasoning. More often than not, we make decisions in a fast, intuitive, automatic way leading to systematic errors of judgment, what we call biases, such as present bias, overconfidence of our capability, loss aversion, inertia bias, procrastination, all of these biases that affect our decision making. Pioneers such as Herbert Simon, Daniel Kahneman, Richard Thaler have focused on similar issues, bounded rationality, cognitive biases, heuristic, behavioral economics, and really focusing on why people behave the way they do. And were awarded Nobel Prizes in Economics in 78, 202, and 2017. 
Richard Taylor, in his book Nudge, his very well-known book Nudge, co-authored with Cass Sunstein, has further focused on how to use choice architecture types of interventions to steer people in the right direction using cost-effective intervention and while preserving freedom of choice. Indeed, nudge units and behavioral insights team have been applying these insights from behavioral sciences, including disciplines such as psychology, behavioral economics, sociology, anthropology, neuroscience, and so on. And nudge units have become very fashionable, starting with the first one set up in 2010 by the then Prime Minister in the UK, David Cameron, the Behavioral Insights team. President Obama set up his own social and behavioral sciences team at the White House. And since then, we have probably around more than 50 nudge units in government. In the MENA region, we're proud to say that Qatar led the way, with the first nudge unit being set up inside the Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy by His Excellency Hassan Tawadi. And then soon after that, we saw several nudge units and in, in, in the setup, such as in Lebanon and in Kuwait. More are being planned. And we've seen its application in a variety of policy areas, from public finance management to education, to inclusion, to prevention of violent extremism, all the way to health and non-communicable diseases. Now we will discuss the application of the behavioral insights for tackling non-communicable diseases at various stages. So first and foremost, we look at the lifestyle and prevention stage, where we address many of the common risk factors using a behavioral insights, such as healthy diet, physical activity, to name only a few. Secondly, we discussed using behavioral insight for early detection of the diseases using screening and monitoring. And in fact, actually, just want to bring to your attention one recent trial we just kind of finished um, two days ago at the on the back of the Beirut Marathon on Sunday, where with a cardiologist with us who will speak later on, we uh, screened runners before they went for the marathon for cardiovascular disease, in particular for hypertension, and the results were very telling. So 25% of those uh, screened had hypertension, but what's more, what's more telling is that about 75% of those were not aware of their condition. And we'll talk more about this later on. But then we discuss, at the end, adherence to medical treatment and the recommendations by physicians, which become a critical behavior once diagnosed with the disease. This life course approach is the backbone of our WISH report on behavioral insights, which you see here, you can have a copy of that. This report, um, we have one of the co-authors with us, uh, Ivo, um, provides a review of the evidence on the application of behavioral insights on select NCDs, and we focus in that report on diabetes, on cardiovascular disease, and on cancer. We hope we it does provide policymakers with ideas for potential application to challenges that have behavioral load. I turn now to the panel, and as I mentioned, Dean Fried will now present the public health perspective to non-communicable diseases and she'll talk about drivers of healthy lifestyle and how to use them as a form of prevention of chronic conditions, such as NCDs. Welcome, Dean Free. The Thank floor you. is yours. Thank you so much, Fadi, and, and good afternoon. It's an honor to be here with all of you. Let's see, do I need to advance the slides? Yeah. So I. Uh, as you can see from the slide, I was asked to talk about drivers and import of healthy lifestyles. And, and I'll start from where Fadi left off in terms of the data of how so many different contexts of, uh, of health and drivers of health going on simultaneously. Um, the consequence uh, on the good side of the ledger, the exciting side of the ledger, 
is that as a result of really intentional investments in uh, child survival, but, uh, decreasing maternal mortality, prevention of infectious diseases, and the list goes on and on, around the world we have added 30 years to human life expectancy in the last century and for many countries in the last 20 to 30 years. Unprecedented in human history. An amazing accomplishment. Um, and you see here on the slide the global increase in life expectancy since uh, f uh, over the last 100 years, um, but particularly for the last 40 or 50 years uh, for the Middle East. And this is happening globally in almost every country of the world. And it's a great success of public health, medicine, education, and poverty alleviation in particular. One of the questions if we're living longer lives is whether we will live them with illness or with health. Um, from my own point of view, if we can figure out how to increase health span so it matches life expectancy, then we have the opportunity to unleash the opportunities of the longer lives we wanted to have our children have. So how do we do that? Well, one starting point, of course, is what Fadi just said about the dominance of what we call non-communicable diseases. Um, and that's exemplified here, the data for the Middle East and the rise of cardiovascular disease, uh, again, in the last 40 to 50 years. And the trend has been pretty inexorably upward. Um, but that's true globally. Um, these are regional data, but, but you see the same thing globally. And of course, we know there are many causes of that. It's not that the world has uh, lost willpower. Um, it is that, the, in general, the, what, our, what we do in terms of our own lifestyles has changed, and those are drivers, but also the environments we're exposed to are huge drivers of this increase in disease. Some of it, uh, by having longer lives, it gives us the opportunity to manifest diseases that take decades to develop. But in fact, a lot of these diseases are appear appearing in middle age. So what are the contexts? Well, I said lifestyle. Um, we know, of course, that diet and physical activity in particular, smoking, alcohol use, um, are huge drivers of the increase in every one of the non-communicable diseases except um, maybe you could say not pulmonary disease. Um, and the environments we're exposed to, like air pollution, are huge drivers. Air pollution is now the fourth leading cause of death in the world and the major cause of non-communicable diseases uh, because it creates inflammation, it interacts with smoking. So um, those are long discussions, but, but it's in our environments and our health and lifestyles that have changed um, over and are driving this. The great news is that we know from 30 years of science that prevention actually works and it really matters. And it changes these trajectories. And I, I'd like to show you a little bit about what that looks like at national levels because a number of countries over the last 50 years have invested in national and regional experiments to drive those data, those numbers down. So in the US, um, we, from 1969 to 2013, as a result of national campaigns to screen and treat blood pressure, uh, hypertension, to lower salt, to uh, change diets, to get people more physically active, to treat blood, elevated blood pressure, all those things in combination, there, there was a decline, a dramatic decline in mortality from heart disease and stroke, a 68% fewer deaths from heart disease, 77% fewer deaths from stroke, and that was at every age, and people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, mm -hmm. you saw this decline. So these interventions really matter. Um, if you look at Finland, Finland, um, particularly Eastern Finland, uh, responded in the 1960s to the 
huge increase in deaths in middle-aged men in Finland due to cardiovascular disease, and they implemented a national uh, approach to really uh, target everything in society that might be contributing. They call it an all of society approach to reach people in many ways in every aspect of their lives. Um, and look what happened. Uh, here you see the data from 1967 to 2012. Um, this amounts to an 82% decline in coronary heart disease mortality for men and 84% for women over that time. Um, quite impressive. And it was a national effort where they looked to change every single part of their lifestyles that could be contributing to that. Um, and through science to understand what to target, through mobilization of every sector to do their part, um, and um, everyone had responsibility to change both environment, social norms, and their own behaviors. If you think about these data, and there are now similar data in a number of countries, um, the, I think the key here is what Fadi said before, which is that these, these diseases, of course, take a lifetime to develop, and they're the accumulated result of our, our ongoing behaviors. And um, the success of increased life expectancy comes from saving people's lives, but it also comes from investing at, agent, at every age and stage in future health, uh, which is absolutely critical and we now know works. So how do we think about that? Well, certainly making sure that we are engaging people at every age and stage is critical. Um, this is a figure that I particularly like uh, from um, Tom Frieden, who at an uh, earlier point in his life was the New York City Commissioner of Health and then went on to head the U.S. Centers for Disease Control. But this figure basically tries to explain the many levels of intervention that are needed for an individual to be successful. Um, and the bottom of the pyramid um, is the socioeconomic and contextual factors of people's lives, which uh, may or may not be hard to modify, but if modified, have the greatest effect. Uh, the next layer is changing the context to, of people's lives so that healthy decisions are the easy decisions to make. Uh, Fadi is engaged in that a lot. New York City, where I have the privilege of living, is uh, the health department um, tries to do that in every single way. Certainly mandating that you couldn't smoke in restaurants uh, made it easier for people to not smoke in restaurants <laughs> who didn't even want to and not to inhale the smoke that people otherwise they would have been exposed to. The middle one, of course, is long-lasting protection interventions. All of these are at the population level. And, um, and then the top of the pyramid is the individualized clinical interventions and counseling and education for behavior change. Now, one of the things that New York City learned early on, and this is a slide from Dr. Frieden, was that um, you can see here from 1993 to about 2001, there were huge efforts to, to persuade people to stop smoking or not to smoke. And you can see in that red line that it didn't budge. It stayed at a prevalence of 21.8% of New York City's adult population over that time period. Despite all the best efforts of clinicians of the city uh, to, to be persuasive. And then it started to go down, and, and it started to go down when that pyramid was started to be implemented. So in addition to clinicians uh, counseling their patients to not smoke, in addition to the ongoing education, they started layering in changing norms through policies so that you couldn't smoke in restaurants, it, and to shift increasingly in every sector of the city the um, ways in which people recognized that they couldn't smoke. It involved taxation and other policies, and it took the combination of all of those things at every level of that pyramid to take the 
prevalence of smoking down, but it, but it did, and it went down to um, about, it's down now at 15% with the maintenance of those combined approaches. Uh, there are people like Bobby Milstein who have done very elegant analyses, which this simple figure exemplifies, of saying that if you only implement in the red uh, universal health coverage, you might see a little bit of decline in annual deaths. If you add, actually, ca medical care with the coverage uh, in the blue line, you see that you could project uh, a lot more. But if, on top of that, not one or the other, but in combination, you add uh, health promotion and protection and interventions across that whole pyramid, then the likelihood of uh, mortality drops tremendously. So um, here's an example of the impact that they had in Finland. I, I told you that they took an all of society approach but I'll just pull out one small example of that. Um, you're looking at a graph of butter consumption in Finland. <laughs> um, it was agreed that, in fact, Finns in the 1950s were consuming a huge amount of animal saturated fat, uh, heavily in the form of butter, and that that was an important contributor to the heart disease rates and stroke rates in Finland. And so they addressed every part of the supply chain and norms and behaviors that went into the high amount of butter that the Finns used. Um, that included actually getting uh, bakers to use less butter. It included getting uh, companies to make butter uh, alternatives from vegetable oils. And it included getting people to change the amount of butter they used. In combination, they drove that down. And this, as well as changes in many other risk factors, which have been documented, in, in combination led to the national dramatic, dramatic decrease in, in deaths, but in incidence in the onset of disease. So I'll end by. Um, saying that this is, there are, I think, learnings from many countries now. Um, certainly the UK and um, South Africa, Japan have implemented salt reduction strategies like this. Um, it has to happen at the, at the contextual level to enable people to have the option for healthy choices. We can, we can tell people to do it, we can nudge them to do it, but if it's not easy to do it, um, because the environment has been changed to make health the easy option, it's very hard for individuals. So I'll end by, um, with two points. One is that um, every country in the world has lived through um, a first demographic dividend. The transition from the high mortality of an agrarian society to one with declining child mortality declining fertility rates and children living to adulthood. A great success. And transitioning from there to, to people actually living into older age, declining mortality rates. Um, how we actually invest in these children living with health through a longer lifespan is absolutely critical. Um, it's not just that they're living longer, but they're living for 50 or 70 more years with health is, is the challenge that will unleash an opportunity. And I think the opportunity that could be unleashed is very fabulous for everybody. I've been calling it the opportunity to build a third demographic dividend. Um, if we can create an increased health span so that people can live not just long but healthy lives, we have the opportunity to benefit from the assets of the longer lives we wanted. And every, every age group, every generation will gain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll come back to you with more questions, particularly on the third demographic, which is my favorite part. Uh, um, I now turn on um, to uh, Ivo Laev, who will cover um, uh, the, the two first stages of the what we call the behavioral change pathway, meaning 
the healthy lifestyle and prevention, followed by screening and, and monitoring for early detection. Ivo. Thank you very years. much, and Linda, thank you for the eye-opening presentation. I just realized I, um, after hearing all the scenes of human behaviors, which I succumb to, I need to start uh, doing what I preach, which is behavioral change. So I'm a master of manipulation. So basically, I'm an experimental psychologist by background, and I spent a very long time trying to understand why the bottle of human rationality is half empty. Why we make decisions that we re later regret, and why we not act the decisions that we've made. And we spent a long time in the lab scanning humans' brains when people were making decisions about health, wealth, and happiness, and trying to understand which parts of the brain light like a Christmas tree on Christmas night, and explain in this way what underlying neural mechanisms predict human predictably irrational behavior. And predictably irrational is the most important part here. And, uh, Later on, I start getting interested. Hang on a minute. If we can predict behavior in the lab, maybe we can predict behavior in the real world. And maybe we can influence behavior in the real world. So, so basically, the first bit of this presentation is about applying behavior insights to health. So my, my, my first point is, what is behavior insights? Just a kind of recap of what we know about the nature of human nature. So essentially, what we discovered for the last 50 years in behavior economics is that there are two types of thinking, or two different ways of processing information in the brain. And uh, it's an interactive division of labor. So usually, we think about uh, reflective, slow, conscious understanding as the driver of choice, which is not always the case, actually. It turns out this creature is uh, Mr. Spock from Star Trek. He's a Vulcan. He's a omnipotent, rational creature who is always reflective, attentive, and effortful. And uh, it turns out actually only 80, uh, only 20% of human behavior is explained by that way of processing information. It turns out that 8 out of 10 human decisions are automatic, subconscious, and very fast. And they can be explained by different ways of processing information. Fast, which illustrated by this case, is um, Homer Simpson, who is an uh, automatic and quick decision maker, not voluntary processing information, in, not in control of his behavior, an effortless choice maker. And uh, it turns out that 8 out of 10 choices and 8 out of 10 behaviors are automatic. 8 out of 10 actions that brought you to this chair here, they're automatic, out of your voluntary control. It, even if you like this presentation, you might actually, next time you walk inside this room, sit on the same chair without realizing you're sitting on the same chair. It's really powerful how the brain controls behavior because the brain is a very efficient machine. It tries to preserve time and tries to preserve energy. So what happens in reality when you see an information outside you and you recognize this information and the environment, suddenly you, you automatically start behaving in specific ways. It triggers the automatic processing of, in the brain, and you make a quick decision. However, very rarely, when you see something which is non-familiar and, and, and very uh, surprising, we start thinking slowly and reflectively and making a more rational choice. The bottom line is that, as you can see here, four out of five choices are automatic. And it's very difficult to predict these decisions, and it's very difficult to actually influence these decisions unless we know how the, those automatic choices are made. So what happens in the last 50 years, we managed to classify all the automatic ways in which we process information. It turns out we don't respond to information in a reflective and considered way, and instead we are making choices based on our automatic, very fallible human brain. And there are about 22 biases that are explained in this review that influence healthcare choices of patients and clinicians alike even rational clinicians, like effect heuristic, bang wang effect, default bias, impact bias, loss aversion bias, optimism bias. I can go down the list. They're all explained in, in this report to you. Uh, but all I'm going to do now is to see how some of these biases can actually help us understand lifestyle choices and maybe help us influence lifestyle choices, which is the most interesting bit here. So first, I'm going to show you how one specific bias, like loss aversion, can actually help us influence people in a positive way. Don't forget that these biases are double-edged sword. They can actually make people do the wrong thing. For example, we don't save enough for retirement. We don't buy health insurance. Why? Because paying for something like health insurance or pension feels like a loss, feels like a loss of our current consumption. Therefore, we are reluctant to spend money on health insurance. But we can use the same bias to influence people because we're predictably irrational. So this is. Uh, a bias which essentially says that the tendency to prefer avoiding losses than acquiring gains of the same amount. And the reason we are loss averse is because the opportunity to gain something is pleasurable, 
but the emotional response to, lose, to loss is actually much more powerful. For example, if I walk out of this room and lose ten dollars on the way out, I feel very miserable. If I fi find this ten dollars on the way back in, I feel happy, but overall my, ha my happiness will be decreased because the impact of losing ten dollars will be stronger than the pleasure from finding back these ten dollars. So this principle was used actually at the workplace to make people lose weight and change their lifestyle. This is intervention in the workplace where they actually wanted to prevent diabetes by making people change their diet and physical activity. And they set up goals to different employees. And the trick was that if they achieve their weight loss, they can gain some money. But the way they set up this incentive scheme was very smart. So essentially the employees are contributing every month to a deposit account and the employer was contributing as well to the deposit account. At the end of the month, if the goal was achieved, they're getting their money and they're getting the money from the employer. However, if they fail to achieve the goal, they're losing all the money. As you can see, the intervention was way more successful than the standard control group who only receive education and reflective information. So they lost weight and it was very sustainable. So you can see how the same amount of money could be spent in different ways. There's another automatic bias, really interesting, why it's called order effects. Order effects influence scale decisions by something which is known primacy or recency effect. Essentially what happens is that information presented at the beginning or end of series in front of us is remembered to chosen more often than information presented in the middle. If you see something at the beginning, it's more salient and focuses more attention than something presented in the middle. And also actually something presented at the end. So the beginning is really powerful driver of our attention. And uh, there are dozens upon dozens of studies and interventions published in the literature which actually implement this design shown in this caricature, where Homer Simpson was tricked into actually eating fruits for dessert instead of donuts by simply putting the fruits at more visible place in front of the poor hapless creature. And I've done that in working environments, in factories, I've done it in schools, if you put the healthy uh, objects in front of the person, the healthy food in front of the person, they're more likely to select it than if you put it some further away. And it works. It increases consumption of healthy food. I'm a professor, I'm a rational creature, I still eat what's in front of me until you remove it from me without being aware of that. So on a more serious note, talking about engaging different uh, stakeholders, uh, also the industry is a very important stakeholders about the environment, as you mentioned. McDonald's, I work with McDonald's, and they try to actually improve the health of the consumers, believe it or not. There's a new breed of McDonald's out there in the UK. There's new legislation coming in Europe about sugar. It's called sugar tax. You tax sugary drinks. To start with, you might tax every other sugary product. And McDonald's wanted to make the first step, actually reducing sugar consumption in the stores. So they called me and said, well, listen, can you help us? We want people to drink less sugary drinks because that's the biggest enemy of the state uh, in UK. And uh, what we had opportunity is to actually work with electronic boards where people can actually order their food. As you walk in McDonald's, you see these electronic boards and you can order a drink. And the standard uh, board looks like that. You order your Mac, your fries, some other, click on the button for drinks, and you can see all the sodas like Coca-Cola, Diet Coke, Coke Zero, Fantas, and so on and so forth. So I apply this principle of order effects and the bias to pick the first that comes in line, subconsciously and automatically, and we reorder the drinks we just by moving the Coca-Cola at the end of the line. Did it work? Oh yes, it bloody did. So it actually it increased the consumption of sugar-free drinks by a third, and you reduce the consumption of sugary drinks by a third. There are 180,000 more low-calorie drinks sold. Actually, we managed to take out 90 tons of sugar out of the bloodstream of the nation. It was randomized trials across 1,000 stores in England. Really powerful result. So moving ahead, let's think about detection and monitoring. That's really important stage in the, in the process of behavioral change. So I'm going to show you an example I'm not going to talk about biases in, uh, from the list anymore because of time. But it's an example. Uh, I work with Public Health England, Department of Health in the United Kingdom, and we want to increase the uptake of NHS health check. This is a general check of the health 
of individuals after they pass 40, so I passed 40, so I had to do my own health check. And it says she's looking for risk factors associated with various non-communicable diseases, such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, heart attack, and stroke, kidney disease, and dementia. So what happens is that after you, have, after you pass 40, you get a letter from the government, which looks like that. And we also had a chance to modify the letter, and our intervention letter looks like this way. So I'm going to explain the difference now, so we can see immediately some quite striking comparative differences here. But if you look at the original letter that everybody gets, it's obviously quite cluttered. It tells you a hell of a lot of information that is explained in a leaflet that comes with the letter. You are invited to a free health check. The idea of the health check is that it checks your health, and it takes 30 minutes, and it's based on questions and answers, both age, sex, family history, height, weight and blood pressure, and also takes blood sample to check the cholesterol and the glucose level, and so on and so forth, and ask you to go and find and book an appointment. Very few people do. And here is our intervention letter. We use all the behavioral insights in the list you saw at the beginning to actually design it in a more powerful way. And uh, what are the behavioral insights you can spot here? First of all, Salience, the letter is way more simplified. We check out all the information that's already in the leaflet. Second, there's a loss aversion here lurking in. The health check is a time-limited opportunity. It's in August, and that's the only time you can have it. And it's due. You're not invited. It's due. You're meant to be there. And you miss it if you're not there. It creates a, a pressure. There is a messenger effect from the individual practitioner. So, Dr. John Sons, who you already know, we tend to follow what people in high status recommend and people we know and aspire to. That's another behavioral bias in the long list. We also had a commitment device, which is known in our field. Essentially, there was a, a tear of sleep at the bottom of the letter where the person promises to turn up, I'm going to my health check on this date at this time, and you can stick it on the fridge. In addition, we had two SMS messages. One was essentially a something called priming, but essentially it's alerting the person that they're going to receive that letter. Many people don't open the letters. They receive a letter in the box, as many other letters in the box as well, and they don't never open the letter. Many be because they're afraid of debt collectors, for example. We owe money to banks and all kinds of authorities. And this one is priming them. They say, actually, oh, health check. Oh, a health check. I received a message about health check. That must be the one. Okay, I'm going to open this letter. Oh, ooh, I need to turn up. And there was a second SMS, which was a reminder. The day before the health check, it was prompting them to attend. Your NHS health check is due. So here is the result. This is the percentage uptake of the NHS health check in England across the nation. The standard letter achieved 18% uptake. The behavioral designed letter, 30%, almost doubled. Really powerful effect. And what we found initially is that actually it was driven by the letter and also by the prompt message before the health check was due. So there are various ways we can do that. So anyway, so to conclude, essentially, preventing non communicable disease requires embedding behavioral insights in a whole systems approach, same as Linda said. And I guess you might not be able to, to see what's on this map. It's actually a detailed causal map of obesity in the UK region of 2 million people, same as Qatar. And that's why I put it on. And there are loads of factors here interacting with each other, the location, the travel policy, the good food, the, the employer's uh, policy, and the amount of income, the, the pressure on the family, and so on and so forth. All of them are interacting with each other in causal loop. And that's really important to realize that actually we cannot only interact and intervene in one specific location. We need to take into account the whole system, the whole environment, and it's messy. So we need a different approach nowadays. First of all, we need to appreciate the dynamic nature of complex problems and communicable disease. It's dynamic. It's really messy. So we need to model it. Second, we need to nurture across the entire determinants. The workplace, the schools, the transport, the city planning, the food environment, the media influence, the community, you name it. Everybody needs to be nudged. And we need to know how they interact. And finally, there needs to be integration and collective action of teams, campaigns, the state, the public and private bodies, and the individual and the communities. They all have to interact and complement each other. Just to kind of illustrate what I mean here, can you guess where did I find that message? And what this message or advertisement is about? Amazing health benefits. Protects teeth, lowers cholesterol, prevents cancer, helps blood pressure, and gives energy. Oh, I know. That's what I found. It's elixir, isn't it, of life? Well, 
here's where I found it, in Qatar. <laughs> Believe it or not. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? We need the industry and the state and the regulator all jointly working together to avoid nonsense like that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ivan. <laughs> Thank you. That's fine. Um, Luis, I think now the floor is yours to speak about medical adherence with a spin on technology. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ivo. You um, led by example. You're it's quite interesting up. that he's in the middle, so you are in a less powerful position. <laughs> so I started working here in Qatar in the ICAM project with the Qatar University, which was an intervention in childhood obesity. Uh, one of the things we wanted to explore is can we use technology to understand better the lifestyle of those kids that they were in the intervention group. So we try wearable sensors, we try social media like Instagram pictures so like people can get like an idea of what they are eating. Then also we use mobile apps to collect information about their physical activity, etc. And also we also use social media with some parents that they wanted to get extra health education. When we faced many challenges, like many of those wearable sensors that were disappearing, like they, they can destroy even the, the hardest one. Uh, then when we asked the parents if they wanted to get the extra support in social media, we received answers from 20 parents. Guess how many fathers out of 20? One. And he say SMS, no WhatsApp. Uh, so we use it actually with the mothers. At the end of the day, what happened in here is that the data we got was mainly female. Actually, the females that were using much more all the digital health tools that we put into there. Uh, and if it was a combination of mother and girl, it was even, even more. Why this is important? Because even though we didn't plan it, we end up learning many human factors regarding gender in this particular case. We don't know exactly what happened, but imagine now in the age of a artificial intelligence data-driven solution, if the data you capture change across human factors, you better take into account human factor from the design, because otherwise you may end up with solution that only works in females or males. And sometimes we have done also a study with wearable data and we found huge difference between Qatar and UK. Same protocol, same device. So that's a, a point I wanted to, to make. Uh, then how we can increase adherence using technology. This is a project from the sick kids in, in Toronto in Canada. They have a problem with teenagers with cancer. They have pain and they have to manage pain. It's very complex. If you really want to manage pain properly, you need to get pain diaries. As you can imagine, it's hard. In adults, teenagers is far worse. So what they did was to create a video game called the Pain Squad to motivate the teenagers to fill the pain diaries. At the end, this is actually patient report outcomes. So they have the, the body, they can say where they had the pain, the level of pains, but they were not making a pain diary. For them, it was a mission. So they had different missions. They had to resolve different cases. They have also a police crew from the Toronto police giving them advice, education, also motivating them. They did a study and they found actually that the quality of the data that acquire about pain was actually very good. Now let's move a little bit more into trying to change behaviors and treatment. Uh, this is a very famous study, almost 10 years ago. It was also in childhood cancer. Uh, basically, in one type of leukemia, they had to take a pill for two years. The kids are already feeling better. The hair is back, etc. But they have to keep taking the pill, although they are feel, feeling great, for two years. And the pill has many side effects. If they stop taking the pill, the chances that the leukemia come back is very high. And if, they com if leukemia comes back, the chances of dying is very high. So how do you convince people to keep taking the, the medicine and to be adherent to the treatment. So they came with the idea of a video game. So they had the, the video game, the first shooter, they had different guns, different weapons. Each of them 
they resemble different types uh, of treatment for cancer. So you have some of them that are like radiotherapy, some of them that are like chemotherapy. Also, when they were fighting in the virtual world, if they left a little bit of the bad guys, the cancer, then the cancer start to grow to teach about the metastasis and how the cancer can grow back. They did the randomized control trial and they proved that the adherence was much better. Actually, they, they checked it in, in blood, the content of, of the pharmacological treatment. There were also some people that they took the video game, they gave it to teenagers, and then they did the EEG to explore which areas of the brain they were affected. And they compared people using the video game versus people getting like the normal lectures. And as you can imagine, it was like a Christmas tree, the ones with the video game. When we are playing, there are more parts in our brain that are awake. Now you are half asleep, even if you try to listen to me. In a game, you will have been much more awake. And now I will give you an example of a project I was involved before uh, I came to Qatar. Actually, I was in North Norway, very different from Qatar weather. Uh, and it was a European project trying to use technology, in this case, Exergame, for fall prevention in the elderly. The problem is that they are afraid, all people tend to be afraid to fall down some because of frailty that Professor Linda has mentioned. And the main way to prevent falls is actually exercising. Exercising can increase your balance, your strength, but they are afraid to do so. So how do you convince somebody who is tired, who is afraid of falling to exercise? So we can the idea, let's use exer games. Let's use video games so that they can exercise in a fun way. Uh, we, have, uh, we had many participants from a local church uh, in Tromso, and we were so afraid with devices like this. They may fall down. <laughs> and then you can actually break the femur, which is not very nice. We tried with the video games, and mm, they, they were so pissed off with the video games because many times when they started to play, their tune was over, so it was game over. It was so quickly, the video games, that they didn't really manage to, to play. And sometimes we have 90 plus year old people. So in the European project, we, we started to design the video game from the, from the scratch. We had a video game company helping us to do the design. And for example, we have many issues with the, the, they have like carrots for exercising like this. Then we have another one to pick apples. And then they say to us, the apples are disappearing. I don't see the apples. Do you know what was the problem? They didn't see the apples. Why? Because of a visual impairment. So what we had to do was to decrease the mountain side and to increase the sky so that they can see the apples. Then we came with some ideas that are somehow related also for the behavioral nudges and so on, gamification, that you can see the points, how many you have collected, the progress bar, etc. Then we did the interviews to the, to the elderly patients. And you know what they say when we ask them about those things, like the, the, the gamification elements in here, the time, etc. What are you speaking about? They didn't see it. It was there. But at that age, they cannot concentrate as we do. So therefore, if they are concentrate, like taking the apples or the carrots, they cannot see the other thing. So the way they focus is different. But we change everything. And then we were very happy because now we can do the randomized control trial in the, our clinical partner, which is an inpatient clinic in Valence, in the mountains in Switzerland. So we randomized uh, close to 60 patients, half of them with the games, and the other half with the key technology, a piece of paper with the exercises that we're supposed to do. And it didn't work. I mean, it did work, the paper not the video game. Uh, this is the enjoyment, as you can imagine, the Excel games, they, they really enjoy more the Excel game, but after six days, it was actually the paper, more engaging than the video game. Then the adherence to the physical activity, it was pretty much 
in all the time the conventional exercises. Uh, why? We don't know. There are some hypotheses, and that's also the feedback from the healthcare professionals. Uh, they say to us that we, when we were designing and we spent years and having meetings with the, health, with the patients every two weeks, we were taking into consideration something to engage only during one moment. It's very hard to simulate engagement long term. The design method, participatory design, co-design and so on, they are very good to get something engaging, but you cannot simulate long term. Long term, you really have to do it. There is no other way. Then also the clinical setting. So this was an inpatient clinic. So people were spending there two weeks. And here we were designing with the church club every Friday. Very different context. It was almost like a party. Uh, and in here, actually, because of the clinical trial, to try to get everything control, they put the machine with the video game in the corner. And then the machine for the conversional paper-based exercise, and they were in there. Everybody was socializing, chatting, so actually it was much more social engaging, the paper than the video game. And that's also something very important when we do an intervention, especially using technology that are many factors can affect, you need to think the ecosystem where it's going to be integrated. Otherwise, you may find something that you are not expecting to. But basically, that was everything. And the very important thing, always, you have to try an error and think that technology is a social technology when we are speaking about computer, and you need to understand the whole ecosystem, like I will mention, and also Professor Linda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luis. <laughs> Thank you very much. So now we have, have you seen, three perspectives, a public health perspective, a behavioral science perspective, and a technology perspective. So we have time for um, a good 15 minutes for question and interactions. So as I ask you to raise your hands to get the um, microphone, do we have questions, please, from the audience? Maybe I can start as you prepare. Can you? I can start with uh, Dean Freed to ask about the third demographic dividend, in particular, to see whether you've seen resistance in drawing the elderly into economic activities and nudging policymakers, worrying about them being kind of the, the younger generation being crowded out, for instance. And can you? Give us examples of few success uh, stories, programs of bringing in the elderly. So uh, one of the interesting things uh, about thinking about older adults is that in many societies, we think about them as somehow the other. <laughs> uh, and we have um, encoded that in a lot of policies and theorems and principles which um, turn out, in the main, not to be true. One, for example, is that older people don't engage and they're not interested in being engaged. I can, um, in general, if you look at communities, older, older people tend to be the bedrock of most communities. They tend to be, historically, the community glue, the community watch, the oral historians, the passers-on of knowledge and practice, they just don't get paid for that in general. Uh, but, but certainly, I, and I can talk about the US uh, data, um, most, one of the things, uh, I'll speak for, uh, from my clinical experience as a geriatrician, the thing that consistently I found in my patients over many years made people sick, ill, predict death, was having no reason to get up in the morning. People of every age need meaning and purpose and need to be engaged. And um, on the societal side, there's lots of concern that if older people are working, that younger people will not have jobs. In fact, it's one of many myths that have been debunked because in fact societies where older people are engaged and um, if, if you want to talk about paid work, creating wealth in society, there are more jobs for younger people and they're generally not competing for the same jobs. 
So um, people need to be engaged. They need to matter. They need to be making productive contributions to the, their family, their community, the world around them. And in fact, older people are motivated, perhaps more than at least as much as other age groups, to want to leave the world better than they found it before they die. Thank you. Um, so what we haven't organized are, in general, are the opportunities for roles and responsibilities in this 30 years of life we've added. Um, so that people um, actually in the same kind of frameworks can engage in ways where they don't have to invent every single role um, and where they actually are empowered to create value. And when that happens, people sign up in droves and we've demonstrated and others have demonstrated that you can actually create roles that older people perhaps can earn a living from, perhaps they're volunteering, depending upon their circumstances, but they can, we can harness the assets of, of people who have lived long and in their own ways successful lives to, conf to be able to translate that into societal benefit. And it's a gain. To the economist and you, I would say, we just don't have the metrics to measure the value. Happiness, thank you very much. Please. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm Selma Rawa, Professor of Public Health at Imperial College London. It's quite interesting. And before the session, we were chatting between us and saying that uh, most of diseases, if not all, are governed by our behaviors, including infectious diseases, sexually transmitted diseases, name it. And I think we are recognizing that changing behavior may not be just by one message or one video or one phone. It, it, it's illusion to think this way. It's truly illusion. We need some interventional public health. That's the terminology we started to use now. And interventional public health is that face-to-face -face contact. And the continuity and support given to individuals, healthy individuals, and maybe even using what we have in medication or some other uh, 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 things available to us, you know, to change behaviors. The best example is, is smoking. I mean, is, if you look at all the studies in relation to smoking, with the exception of uh, uh, fiscal uh, uh, measures, i.e. increases the prices to something which nobody can buy cigarette, and the example of that is actually in Europe. And the second one is a smoking cessation a clinic, which is a, 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 a almost a clinical setting, even using prescribing. So let us not really uh, simplify the subject in a way in saying that, oh, we can apply behavioral insights and, and by showing a video or using uh, uh, that technique or uh, this technique, you know, it's multidimensional. It may be useful to use some of the techniques mentioned, but in my opinion, and the panel need uh, to give us an idea on how to bring that multifaceted approach, including what I mentioned as interventional public health. Great, thank you very much. I'll take another question. I'll take two more questions and then we go back to Uh, my name is Roberto Bertolini. I work in the Ministry of Public Health here in Qatar. Um, you know, I found, congratulations, a very beautiful presentation, very interesting. Um, you know, it's clear that uh, if you want to reach the objective, also what was said before, you need to integrate these three dimensions and even more. You know, the slide that you showed obesity is actually quite meaningful. So I just wonder whether you have any example of integration of these different dimensions on a concrete public health you know, project in an area or something where you can see the, you know, the, the way in which this can be translated in practice. Thank you. Two more questions. Hi. Since, since we're here in Qatar, you mentioned three behavioral insights groups here in the Middle East. Could you maybe mention some of the specific 
initiatives and ways that what's been done in the UK and other places has been adapted specific to the region and not just kind of implementing wholesale what's what's been done, but sort of some kind of unique thing that's taken advantage of different behavioral patterns here and maybe specific examples of that and, and what the, the measurable results are? Sure. I think let's, uh, let's stop here. I, I'll just uh, give you the chance to answer maybe Ivo on um, the, the need for multidimensional approach. Just want to say that we, in behavioral insights and, and nudging, we never say that it's a panacea or it solves the problem. We say it's a complementary tool. And we always say that there are times when you dissect the problem, look at the behavioral root, kind of identify it for various perspectives, you might decide this is beyond nudging and beyond application and the command and control or the incentive or the provision information is more what needed. So what we try to do is one, complement, understand the behavioral loop and hopefully try to make measurable improvement. Ivo, we would like to take on this, please. Well, the short answer is so I agree completely. And uh, the longer answer is that well, historically, we have fantastic examples how integration of different approaches works, which is smoking cessation. Especially in the UK and the Western world, smoking rates steadily go down, more for women than for men for the last 50 years, as a result of concerted effort across several ways of influencing people. One is a fiscal measure, economic incentives, just essentially make smoking expensive. The second is uh, um, legislation or coercion, the smoking ban in UK, uh, and when people are banned to smoke in public place, so they have to go out and smoke, and uh, that creates lack of opportunity to smoke, right? And also feels about a bit of a stigma and feeling ostracized. And the third approach is motivational approach, social marketing campaigns, showing the, in an emotional way, an emotionally engaging way, the consequence of smoking. So indeed, there are ways to do it, and that, but m there are many ways to skin a cat. And what's happened recently, we realized about the motivational aspects, is that there's much more to human behavior than information and incentives. As we said at the beginning, majority of human behavior just comes about, is not reflectively thought about. Majority of human behavior just comes about, triggered by the environment, is not reflectively thought about. And the, the mantra in policy making that the best protection is self-protection, I tell you what's good for you, and you better know what sh you should do. It just doesn't work, and that's why we realized in 2010, uh, after the book Nudge was published, that we need to do much more in this area, and that's why we published the Mindspace report. As a result of this Mindspace report, my colleagues, my co-author, set up the first behavior insights team at the center of government in the UK, the cabinet office, the behavior insights team, where we're actually informing policy decisions across the board. And since then, uh, many governments, including the US, the White House, before Trump came in, he, he fired the behavioral team. But uh, uh, the European Commission and other governments, 60 old governments, have their own behavioral teams. So, so indeed, we need to do more on the motivational side. But just to kind of conclude, uh, when we design interventions, we try to cover all necessary and sufficient conditions for behavior to emerge. And motivation is only one of these three fundamental periods of behavioral change, where the motivation is reflective or automatic. The another pillar, apart from motivation, is capabilities. We need to make people more capable to change, provide them yeah. with the tools, with the knowledge and the skills to change, especially in smoking cessation, to be able to suppress their impulse, uh, to have uh, replacement therapy, for example, uh, vaping and so on. And we need to, th that's capability. And the third pillar is opportunities, social and physical opportunity. If you remove opportunities in the environment to consume harmful goods, more or less people stop consuming harmful goods to an extent, because if you remove opportunities, the goods go into the black market. So there's a limit how much you achieve with the fiscal, uh, with price, and also with uh, cr creating opportunity or lacking opportunity. So the th three factors are capability, opportunity, and motivation drive behavior and we call it the combi model, it's more comprehensive. It covers all the necessary and sufficient conditions for any behavior to take place, and that's how we design interventions. And all interventions should be multifaceted, multidimensional, and complex, covering all necessary conditions. So I, I'm just elaborating on what you just said, but I agree. And that's how we really do it in, in, in practice. These are simple examples when we actually trigger mo automatic motivations because we realize that the, the cases I present are driven by automatic motivations. Thanks very much. Yes. Okay. I can give you also some comments. I have been trying to put technology into the health domain for almost 15 years. Maybe I have been involved in 10 projects, 
out of those, one or two are actually now being used by thousands of patients. So most of the project fail. One of the reasons is because of the work, work project. We are dealing with something very complex. You have to take into account the healthcare setting, the motivational factor, cultural factor. Just to find out how you do it, it may take a couple of years. And then you have to try out. Once you try, it's a different setting, so it's not a real one. So, and then you have to implement. And most of the uh, use of digital health or technology for behavioral change, they tend to be projects that are only two, three years. So by, it's impossible. You cannot do it in two years. You cannot do it in three years. So maybe one of the things we need to change is to stop speaking about projects, but programs. I don't know if you noticed the slide from Finland. Actually, my wife is Finnish, so she would have been very proud. Uh, it was a 20 years effort. So why when we are dealing with technology to support behavior change, we only engage for a couple of years? So we need longer project, cluster project with mm -hmm. many multidisciplinarity aspects. And the way we fund projects is not always that way. Dean Fried. So I'd, I'd also like to respond to the question about uh, from two people about um, <coughs> how to think about the multiple influences on uh, both risk factors and the development of disease. Um, we've been talking about the multiple ways to modify an individual's behavior and, and make the, a healthy choice, the easy choice for a single risk factor. But the challenge goes well beyond that because um, there are many things affecting that person's health. Um, let's just start with smoking, since that's the example of the moment. Um, smoking causes 14 disease, chronic diseases. Um, and, but there are other things that actually have their own independent effects of the same magnitude as smoking. One is air pollution. Um, and in fact, the effects of air pollution also worsen the effects of smoking. Um, quite significantly. All of the behavioral modifications that we will use to decrease smoking aren't going to help the air that the person's inhaling every single second. And so if we're trying to actually create health, which is the ultimate goal, then we have to make sure that at a societal level we're taking care of the inputs the individual can't control. Um, and that requires a different level of analysis. For example, in New York, um, the environmental scientists in my school showed that it was the diesel buses in New York City that were idling in a certain neighborhood in Harlem that were the driver of the epidemic of asthma in Harlem. If you go to Beijing and you look at pediatric hospitals in the line around the block every morning, with asthma, you know it's the air pollution. Um, there, are, so you have to. I think the multiplicity of inputs, as well as the multiple factors that modify behavior, make this complex. But also um, realize that there are many levers that can be pulled to affect health in the context of NCDs. Thank you very much. So, uh, can we have two two quick questions? Well, well, thank you for a very interesting discussion. I'm Abdi Abu Samra. I'm co-chair for the National Diabetes Committee here for, in Qatar. And I'm listening to the behavioral modification as a tool, not just for prevention, but also for management of diabetes, because it's worked both ways. And listening to the smoking story success, and uh, so something come to my mind, which is, for when we talk about smoking, nothing in it good. Everything is bad. We can put you know, we can shoot it from all directions, from, from public health, from, whereas when it comes to food, there's a lot of good things about it. And it is very hard to label it as bad as smoking or to fight it from all directions. There will be McDonald advertising, there will be, you know. So we need to come up with a way that allow us, but I think nutrition is the main cause of, let's say, of many of the things around the world. Physical inactivity is important, but mostly we become obese because of what we consume. 
course. And um, so, for instance, fighting, uh, let's say, butter and cholesterol ended shifting people to consume more calorie from carb, which actually was worse than the cholesterol itself. So I'm just thinking is, uh, for instance, uh, something come to my mind maybe to come to an international label for food we can label nutritionally poor, MP, and calorie dense, CD, MPCD, and say this is bad, and put some label on some food, and try to fight it as we're fighting, let's say, smoking and so on, to put it in the mind of people, this kind of food is nutritionally poor, have no vitamins, uh, and is calorie rich, and will lead to so and so. We need to label it as we label smoking, or label drugs, because currently it's hard. Every food we try to label to change, you know, uh, to change people behavior, it's uh, somebody else saying it's good in it. And so I would like to think what you, right. you know, think about this. Agree. It, it requires more than changing people behavior. We need to go back to the industry, reformulating and a lot of this. Can we have? So. It's, it's not a question. It's just a comment on what you were saying. Can we really label something as bad if other people see benefit in it? Because the food essentially is nutrition. So it, we can't really label a food bad because there's some benefit to it to some extent. Um, it's more about consumption. So it's behavioral as opposed to labeling the food bad. Is it, it, should, Shouldn't we be addressing consumption versus the actual food? Yeah, probably, probably both. Uh, can I can I just uh, give the floor, Nabil? Can I give the floor to Sheikh, please? Uh, as as we um, kind of take another round of questions, I just want to say that there are things that we've done in the region that are replication of things that have worked, like getting people to pay on time the electricity bills using social norms. That has been one of the most uh, kind of quoted experiment done by the behavior and science team. We've done a lot of choice architectures around cafeterias, around supermarket to increase the healthy uh, sh shopping choices. There are things that we've done that are pretty new, using retrieval practice in entrepreneurship to increase test scores, using value affirmation for kind of also including uh, learning outcomes for education, and then using social norms dynamic social norms to improve compliance. And that's an area where you could use it also for kind of smoking cessation within restaurants where compliance for indoor smoking is not working. So we're working on a lot of things that are very kind of contextual. And of course, one of the great examples that are often quoted is using um, kind of the power of timing and in, for example, testing for diabetes during Ramadan in a Grand Mosque in, in, uh, in, in Qatar to kind of screen for people f to check whether they're aware that they are diabetic or not. This is one of the greatest examples which we replicated, but in the area of the marathon where we got people to test for hypertension. So these are things that are very contextual and that are very important and they're responding for the pain points within the region. We could talk more about this, but Sheikh, yes, your... Okay. Thank you, uh, thank you all. Just a chance, because we are speaking about behavioral in this session about NCD, and you are all most welcome tomorrow to NCD session for us. I would like to ask, we have a list of best buys in WHO. It was a great list that we were achieving in Qatar, and we are hunger for more best buys. Till now, the list is not very big, and we start. We are working on all of them. I hope that we achieve more with them. So, my question for each one of you: If the, uh, the uh, sorry, the general secretary of WHO come to you and ask you, what is the one best buy you would like to add in public health, in behavioral, or technology? What is the best buy in your field that you plan to convince WHO to be the the, ad the next ad additional best buy from your side? Thank you. Thank you. In terms of technology, it's very simple. Think Amazon, they really know exactly what you buy, when you buy, and they give you the best advertisement at the right moment, and based on your previous shopping, so it's personalization. If we have data, we can personalize the advertisement you get in Google, while in health communication we get the same uh, health communication for everybody in Qatar and we don't personalized based on your demography, your age, where you are, what you visit. The data is there. It's actually very cheap. 
You can run experiments with Google Ads or Facebook very, very cheap. And also, if we get a lot of data regarding lifestyle from your wearables, which in, po in Qatar are extremely popular mobile technology, why we don't create mobile applications that get adjusted to the right time and the right moment? Using also, of course, all the theory driven, so you don't reinvent, reinvent the square wheel, but actually the wheel that works. And that's something technology is ready, it's cheap, and everybody is using technology. Raise your hand if you don't have a mobile phone. And everybody, I think half of you have been checking the phone while you have been here. So actually, it's a very good <laughs> channel and we are not using it very well. And be careful. Tobacco industry, they are advertising jobs for mobile health experts. That's... Uh, I will. It's my best buy. Okay. The founding father of uh, psychology, Kurt Levin, famously said one. There is nothing so practical as a good theory. And I'm going to repeat it again. There is nothing so practical as a good theory. Theory turns action into wisdom. And acting without comprehensive theory of behavior in this case is like having a hammer and not knowing where to hit with it. So what we need the theory for is to do a comprehensive behavioral diagnosis why the behavior is not taking place. What's wrong? Is it lack of motivation, lack of ability, lack of opportunity, and so on? And there's evidence from systematic reviews of the literature which show again and again and again, if you use a theory, like for example, the comprehensive framework that uh, Fadi mentioned, mind space or shape difference, whatever, then the interventions are more powerful and more longer lasting. And that's why we created this framework, listing all the necessary conditions, all the techniques that could be used. And then theory can tell us what part of the brain is doing the heavy lifting. For example, if you talk about uh, calorie labeling or labeling in general, we've done lots of trials. National trials in Singapore, I finished uh, with a student of mine, showing calories on products. It does work to an extent, but much more is needed. Uh, and if the heavy, list if heavy lifting is done by automatic responses, that's maybe where we need to focus. As you know, the proverbial, the road to hell is covered with good intentions. We change minds and hearts, and we create intentions which lead to nowhere, all the New Year resolutions that end up in the bin. So we need to do more than changing beliefs and intentions, and that's why we use these automatic frameworks or frameworks of automatic behaviors. So if I have a one single bite, is uh, essentially, yeah, use the comprehensive theory of choice that we created to analyze the problem and create complex multidimensional interventions, which we did in Qatar, it's called ICANN. We managed to run uh, a few hundred children through weight loss camps here, with the uh, Qatar University funded by QNRF, and it worked. They lost weight sustainably over a few months during the intervention. We have it published now. Thanks. Thanks, yes. Ivo. Lean Fried? So I guess my vote for a new Best Buy, I think that was your question, um, would be uh, mitigating air pollution. WHO is now recognizing that air pollution is the among the top drivers of many NCDs is the one that we really haven't turned to, but the data are, are quite compelling in terms of the ill health that it causes, as well as um, dampening people's engagement in physical activity, et cetera. We did some analyses uh, a few years ago, which showed that, uh, of course, that has to be addressed at a multi-sectoral level. The individual can't control it, except communities can demand it. Certainly in Beijing, that has been uh, an active factor. But um, our analyses show that the return on investment for society is actually, qu for a country, is quite high uh, after about five years. Uh, from lowering air pollution um, to, um, uh, to equivalent amounts that, um, that the Netherlands did. The return on investment for the economy is high, the return on investment for health is high, and the return on investment for the costs of health care are quite high. Thank you very much. So we have a question and another one. Yes. Uh, Can you introduce yourself? Yes. I'm Javier Bulgarin from the, I'm a physician advisor to the Ministry of Health from Paraguay, South America. Welcome. So um, three things, the hypertension prevalence study that you mentioned, uh, 
you know, when you read about hypertension, they, they, they tell you that you have to be sitting for 10 minutes with both feet on, on, on the ground, et cetera. When you measure blood pressure before an event that can cause anxiety, how, how are you sure, how can you make sure that those people are really hypertensive or it was just a transient elevation of blood pressure before a marathon? For the professor, the, the behavioral science professor, uh, I couldn't help but to feel a little bit disappointed by the study that you mentioned so many brilliant things about behavior and the letter, how you designed the letter study that drove the response rate from 18 to 30 percent. That means that 70 percent still didn't respond to, <laughs> to the intervention. So do you use that as a gauge as to how much we have to still have to learn about behavior? And to the uh, professor's book about the, the gaming, um, don't you think it's a generational thing that, you know, if you repeated that game uh, versus paper study in 50 years, the game would, would beat the paper, I think. Thank you very much. Can we move over there, please? Um, as the microphone moves there, I'm, I'm going to introduce in a second Dr. Kabani, who was the cardiologist working with us on this marathon. Actually, more than two-thirds of the sample took place before the marathon in the, f uh, the last four days where people were going to pick up their kind of shirts and so on. So uh, we, it, was, it was well looked after. And I'll give the floor later on to Sami to explain more on, on this. Go ahead, please ask your question. Um, thank you very much. Um, so um, I'm really interested in... Can you go straight to the point, please? And sure, the yeah. So uh, it's about the sustainability of these and the long-term impact of these, these sort of behavioral insights. So my question is essentially, you know, are we looking to trick Homer Simpson to act like Spock for a moment, or are we actually trying to change Homer Simpson into Spock in the long run? So Good point. The, the, the lady in front of you, I think, I think we need to conclude, unfortunately, I am told. Yeah. Can I give just a last chance for uh, people from the panel to conclude answering? This is the one million dollar question. Why is not 100%? Well, human behavior is stochastic, uh, and human behavior is difficult, and it's multifactorially caused by many factors. And uh, when we evaluate the success of this intervention, we always think in terms of cost effectiveness. What is the cost of doing this? And the cost was zero. The effect was doubling the rates of screening. We've done similar trials in my uh, earlier career with the BAT, where we try to make people pay their tax on time. Everybody who hasn't paid their tax to receive a letter saying, you haven't paid your tax, Please pay. They don't. We added one extra sentence, which counts for free. Nine out of ten people in your city have already paid. You're not one of them. It increased tax repayment by 14 to 15 percent. On a national level, that's a huge amount of money, given that it's free and the money comes to the exchequer. So we, we think about cost effectiveness, and perfect success is difficult because the behavior is very multifactorially caused by all kinds of causes and environmental factors. And, uh, and to answer, uh, but, but of course we can continue working on this and improve our behavioral diagnosis using theory. So to answer the, your question, we don't want to turn Homer into Spock. We just want Homer be Homer. The, the fundamental idea of the nudge approach was that uh, uh, let's not go against the grain of human nature. Let's go with the grain of human nature. If we are automatic, contextual, let us be. But let the outcome of this manipulation be good for the individual and the society as a whole. That was the fundamental insight, which turned the whole debate about irrationality upside down at the time when the book Nudge was published. Until then, the answer was, oh, humans are automatic, they're predictably rational. What should we do about it? Make them rational, educate them, tell them they're stupid, they should know better. It doesn't work. If you try to be reflective, you run out of sugar and time. So that was the fundamental idea. So Spock be Spock, and Homer be Homer, and uh, maybe we'll be happier if we behave in our natural ways. And we always contextual, and that's the fundamental insight, always contextual, and the timing is important. We're acting the choice. So maybe Spock doesn't exist in the end of the day. Let's continue nudging Homer. <laughs> Dean Fried, you have a final word. Uh, no, thank you for the honor of being here. Thank you very much. Luis, one last, one last word. <laughs> I mean, one of one the questions, word. thing like pharmacological treatment, they take like 10 years to develop, and still the doctors don't trust them. They take a few more years and then they start prescribing them. Uh, think 10 years ago, they, we were very proud of our smaller and smaller Nokias from Finland. And look nowadays, we are looking into bigger and bigger phones with touch screen. 
technology changing so quickly, but research methods are not. So we have a huge challenge. We have some technology that they are really pervasive. We use it continuously, and they are changing so rapidly that many of the research methods we have, especially in the health domain, they are not fit for that. So I don't know what will be next. And the, by the time we try to gather evidence, most likely the technology is outdated. I don't have an answer for, for that. Thank you very much, Luis. We have to close, I am told. I'm beyond nudged, I'm beyond nudged by the organizers. Thank you very much. And please join me in giving a round of applause to the panelists.